Hello, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, session of the Years of 2020 uh, conference, uh, a virtual session. Uh, the title is uh, Engaging the Public with the Scientific Process in Science Engagement Organization. Uh, before we get into the content, uh, uh, we have uh, five speakers. Uh, we will try to uh, have a short presentation and leave rooms to the discussion. Uh, discussion which will take place in a sort of uh, a weird way because it's going to be through chat. Uh, so uh, before we start, uh, while I'm introducing and saying so useless things rather than the full content of the of our talk, I'd like to ask you, uh, the people that are attending this room, uh, to show your presence because we need to know that we are talking to somebody by just saying a hello message or something in the chat so that we can somehow have the sensation that we will be there uh, with you. Uh, things that, of course, we would have uh, we would have preferred. Uh, I also would like to check, and maybe you can answer to this in the chat, that indeed in this moment uh, 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 you are seeing us talking. And uh, I would like to to ask that we all the speakers will be uh, around me in mosaic view, so you can have an idea of who is going to talk. So uh, while I'm going on, I'm expecting to have some uh, some feedback. Uh, on the chat that will uh, uh, will uh, make us understand that there is an audience uh, uh, on the other side of the world. Uh, so, uh, what is the topic we want to treat? Uh, we have uh, around uh, in, in, around the table, virtual table, <coughs> a group of people that work in the science engagement, in the public engagement uh, with science uh, field, uh, organizing interactions between uh, the world of science and uh, uh, and, and the public. What we see today is that, uh, uh, I don't need to tell you uh, at the years of conference, but uh, an increasing need of, uh, of alliance, of trust, of, uh, of communication between uh, uh, the society in general and science. This is uh, driven by uh, global issues, uh, global challenges that uh, um, demand more and more uh, scientific content. I don't need to quote uh, uh, epidemics or, or climate change. Uh, from uh, a new way of the media and of the information landscape to work, uh, I don't need to quote uh, uh, infodemics, uh, infox, fake news, uh, and all this uh, pressure that we have, but also from a, a society that uh, more is more and more in demand of new way of participation, new way of uh, 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 for the general citizen to be part of the governance of their community, of their country, and, and of everything, which invests also science. So there are, and also in the scientific way of, uh, uh, of uh, working, the, the, the evolution of science, we have seen a progression on more and more uh, transdisciplinary uh, approach, uh, uh, and also now intersectorial approach. More and more science needs to be in contact with industry, of course, but also with other forces of society. So there are many changes that are occurring. These changes uh, uh, needs to be accompanied by an, a new way of uh, building uh, situations in which this trust that we are talking about between uh, uh, science and society can be built. So what we want to do is uh, to have five examples uh, of very innovative, very interesting way of, uh, of uh, re restructuring, reinventing this dialogue between science and society, to then have a, a, um, a discussion, uh, hopefully with questions coming uh, from the audience uh, ab about this topic. Uh, so um, uh, thank you for uh, sending some messages uh, on, the, um, on the question and answer. Uh, if we can have more, uh, uh, also, maybe uh, if you want to say, uh, if you are a scientist, if you are uh, somebody that uh, work uh, on uh, science policies, or if you are a science communicator, uh, please feel free to, um, uh, to, to, to put things on the chat. So uh, we have this uh, nonverbal, uh, even if it is a written word, a sensation of uh, who is uh, on the other side of the room. Uh, just, uh, I, I'm finished. Uh, uh, I'd like to make a quick tour of uh, uh, the colleagues that are uh, around the table, just asking uh, uh, each of you uh, a simple question of uh, what's your current job. Maybe we can uh, we can start uh, uh, from uh, from Paul uh, Volt. Uh, um, what is your job? What are you doing? Uh, we, yes. 
Hello, I'm uh, Paul Vogt, director of Utrecht University Museum, and uh, we are going to uh, completely renovate our building. And I just came from a meeting where we discussed the communication about uh, the renovation. So great. That's what I and uh, another renovation uh, is from uh, Paris, uh, Antonio Gomez da Costa. Yes, um, I'm the head of uh, scientific communication and education at Universiens, which is I will tell a little bit more later. And we are also in the process, a big process of renovation of a very uh, old but very active uh, science mm -hmm. center. Uh, Catherine Franche, uh, you don't run a museum, you run a network. Yes, hello everybody. I do run a wonderful network uh, that's called Excite, the network of science centers and museums and other organizations that connect science and technology to people. Um, and I'm happy to um, see you all here. Another uh, uh, example will come from another museum in Spain this time, uh, Dutch Hacienda. Hello everyone. I'm the head of science in the Natural Science Museum in Barcelona, and I'm the responsible for running a citizen science project at the museum. We will hear from, uh, from, from you later, and uh, we go back to Italy, Leonardo Alfonsi. Hello, everyone. I'm director at uh, Psiquadro, a social enterprise working in public engagement with science. And you're going to talk about uh, another example, which is a uh, European Researchers' Night, which is a European uh, work, but in which Italy is kind of uh, uh, excelling in, in, in the way it's, uh, it's going to be renovated. So if you uh, agree, thank you for uh, asking some question on the chat. Uh, hello uh, to Croatia, which is uh, listening to us. And uh, uh, the idea is that uh, we will give the floor to uh, three speakers, then uh, we will have a, a moment of exchanges, then two speakers, uh, and then again we can, uh, we can chat. Uh, I will ask you uh, if you have questions if you, of clarification or if you have comments uh, uh, that you want uh, to, uh, to ask the, uh, the speakers to develop, please do it uh, starting now. Uh, I, I, don't wait uh, the question and answer moment uh, to, uh, to um, write your question. You can write it while the speakers are presenting. Uh, of course, we will not treat them right away. I will take care of treating them in the right moment uh, during the, uh, the, the, the session. But do not wait until the end so we can also... Uh, the, the timing is different when we are online. Um, um, and... Uh, um, so uh, I, I, I would say that we can uh, start with the first speaker that, if we agree, is uh, Antonio from, uh, from Paris. As you mentioned, uh, uh, now it's called Universcience, uh, uh, which is the Palais de la Découverte plus Cité des Sciences et de l'Industrie. Uh, it's, in terms of size and in terms of history, is one of the landmark of uh, Science Museum in Europe, which is going uh, into a, a big renovation. So it's particularly interesting for us uh, to, to see uh, how uh, a renovation of such an important place is going to uh, take place and how it's going to uh, uh, be linked and echo the changes and the needs that we have in this science society relationship. So please, uh, uh, Antonio. Okay, so I, I will start um, sharing my presentation. Um, so I'm going to talk about... Okay, so um, I've already presented myself. So I'm, I'm working at Universcience uh, in Paris, and um, I'm, I'm going to talk about the future Palais La Découverte. Just to give you a very quick, uh, this is a very quick uh, presentation just to put you on air of what we are aiming at. So Universcience, there are two uh, institutions um, on the. Sorry, okay. So uh, we have uh, two uh, institutions, the Palais de la Découverte, which I already mentioned, which is the picture on your left side, and the Cité des Sciences et de l'Industrie. Um, and both these institutions are now uh, under one same uh, umbrella, which is Universcience. Though they have very distinct, distinct flavors, 
And um, it's a huge, together we receive more than 2 million pathogen visitors per year in normal times. Unfortunately, obviously now we are fighting with a, a little bit of a different uh, uh, number of, of visitors uh, because it's of all the constraints from COVID. And uh, uh, now we are going to start a process of renovation of the Palais de la Découverte, which is this beautiful building that you see on the left. And it's, a, it's one of the oldest, if not the oldest, science communication uh, institution um, in Europe in terms of a physical presence, constant presence towards the public. Um, it is um, an institution that dates from 1937. And uh, so it's, uh, it, it's quite, quite a history. But what I would like to focus on is on our main goal regarding the presence of research in scientists in the future project. Um, even in 1937, when, when, when this, this institution was open, there was an expression that was uh, it's still being uh, advertised and publicized and considered uh, very strongly from the founder of the Palais de la Découverte, the, the Nobel Prize from physics, Jean Perrin. And he said, well, I want, we want a place where we can montrer la science en transfert, let's uh, show the science as it is being done. A lot has been discussed about this, what this means, but I think that I mean, Jean Perrin being a physicist and everything, he probably was meaning what he said. And so definitely he knew that the fundamental thing is to show people how science is done. It's not, so it's not only about facts or about uh, knowledge that is produced by science, but it's the process itself. And so this is at the core of uh, what we want to do because as in many other places, because of practice, because of the needs, because of our relation to schools, we have been focusing um, on the, 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 the facts and knowledge produced by science. But really, we want to shift a little bit. It's not that we don't do it already, but to shift strongly uh, the contents in the future Palais de Découverte, which will open in 2024, 25. Uh, let's, let's see how things go. But um, to have really a place that, first of all, it's about science in itself. So it's not about natural history. It's not about space exploration. It's not about environment. It's about... And it's not about the results of science. It's about how science works in science in itself. Science considered as a body of knowledge, but mainly as a means of understanding the world and of questioning it as a process of discovery. And that we, in order to pay, be able to develop a scientific attitude um, in the public at large and in society. And we all know, and we have current examples now with the situation of COVID, that one of the main problems, I would say, uh, regarding the, the whole situation is not a lack of understanding of basic facts or effects of science. It's really because we are seeing um, science in action, studying the, 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 this pandemic and the virus and everything. And science in action is quite a messy and complicated thing. We, don't, we are not certain. And this, the public clearly and society at large is feeling a little bit of trouble dealing with this. So we want really a place, this shows the need, and we really want a place where we would deal with this um, scientific uh, way of working and what is science and how, how, how we go about it. Uh, just to mention that we are, we'll be considering adults as the main public, not that we disregard or we put aside schools or, or, or young people, but definitely it is going to be targeting adult public as adults, not as parents, not as people that accompany them and, and come into the, the science center with others, uh, with younger ones, but as adult public with their own needs. And we want to make really accessible the innovation research aspect, aspects and uh, to be a reference also for people that already have knowledge in science and even work in science and have kind of a meeting place with research institutions and with scientists. So finally, just how we plan to do this. Uh, there are several things, but I want to highlight a few, a few features. One of them is to, we already have a, a program that is specifically designed to, to make 
the public and the visitors contact directly with scientists and scientists with the public, which is called a chercheur in my lip, a researcher, one experience, where active researchers come to uh, our place and in practice show, explain what is their research and what they are doing, and they uh, use one experience as the kind of highlight of their questions and their, their research. Um, we want to increase this program much further. Uh, so not only in terms of uh, number of researchers that will be invited, but also uh, at the moment it is uh, one room uh, dedicated to this. We want to make several different um, rooms and capacities available to them. We will have laboratories uh, that uh, will be available to researchers to really have, for instance, uh, a longer uh, experience with visitors where they can uh, actually do some experience or a little bit of a, an experience. Uh, we will have the possibility of doing online exchanges so that the scientists and researchers don't have to move out of their laboratories, quite the opposite. We'll have a, an immersive room where we expect to bring laboratories uh, virtually inside the Palais de Couvert, and so people can exchange in direct uh, with people working in a research laboratory or in a research facility such as CERN or other places, or with uh, 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 an expedition, uh, scientific expedition uh, in the ocean, in the forest. So we want to be able to do this kind of direct exchange. Um, and But we are also aware of a reality that will not change and we will not try to change it because it's pointless to try to do it, which is researchers uh, are doing research. And so they cannot have a lot of time uh, to do this outreach and these exchange activities, no matter how much they like to do it and how good they are at doing it. But the reality is that they have other things to do. And we really, really would like to research and contemporary research to be the main focus uh, and what is the main uh, topics that a visitor will find. And so we uh, are starting a, a, a permanent program of exchanges between explainers and research institutions where uh, we will, uh, together with our scientific advisories, select topics that are currently very, very important in terms of research uh, and have explainers, our explainers, go to the laboratories, exchange with the researchers, become aware of what is happening so that then the explainers at the Science Center will be able to talk about and uh, exchange with the visitors about current research taking place as uh, they are speaking in laboratories. And also we will seek uh, a strong involvement in citizen science, but I think that we will have someone talking about that more profoundly and then we will we'll exchange about that more deeply, how we see our participation in this. And that's all for me for the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio, for this first uh, view. Uh, uh, as I said before, uh, if there are uh, more, uh, if there are questions already, uh, curiosity about this presentation, don't hesitate to start putting them uh, uh, on the chat. But I would like to uh, um, now give the floor uh, to Paul Vogt because uh, Antonio, uh, it's clear that uh, you presented a, a, a renovation, a plan which uh, puts a, a, a closer and more direct relationship with research. Uh, at the core of, of, the, of the strategy. So I think it's particularly interesting to listen to an example of a museum which is within a university. So it's not a, a place that collects uh, scientists from everywhere and brings them to the public space. It's a university that is opening up in order to welcome uh, the public. And so it's uh, uh, interesting to hear how uh, at the Universität Museum in, uh, in uh, Utrecht, uh, you are thinking about uh, uh, reinventing the role of a museum within uh, a university. So uh, I think Paul Vogt can uh, uh, prepare his slide for his presentation and then we can have uh, uh, some, um, some discussion. Don't hesitate to start to pose questions on the chat.
Thank you. Good morning. My name is Paul Vogt. <clears throat> I'm director of Utrecht University Museum. Uh, and our museum is going to uh, undergo a complete redevelopment as a uh, uh, platform of, for public engagement with science. I'm trying to click to my next slide, but it doesn't work. Here it is. Yes. Um, uh, we are uh, on more or less the same path as the previous speaker. Uh, we are a bit further ahead because uh, we, we now start uh, the renovation. Uh, the museum is situated in the city center of Utrecht, the Netherlands. The main target group uh, is the general public, in particular families, uh, families with children and school groups um, in, in about the same age. Uh, students and staff of, of the university also play an important role, but not as our primary target group, but as contributors. Um, they are engaged in the museum scientific outreach work. All museum guides are students of Utrecht University and academic staff are partners in the museum's programs. All the halls of the museum uh, will be completely refurbished and the main reason for the new exhibitions is a strategic shift to become a platform for public engagement as part of the open science strategy of the university. Utrecht University embarks on an ambitious program of, of open science, a movement to make science more accessible and more relevant to society. One of its pillars, uh, best known pillar perhaps is open access, uh, unlimited access to scientific publications and research data. But another important aspect for us is public engagement with science, to involve society in science and science in society. There are all other conditions to be met as well for open science, um, because as long as publications and citations are the only measures of success for scientists, they will not be able to spend much time on engagement with society. So that is why the university also uh, is devising a new rewards and incentives policy as part of the program. Now the mission of the museum is linked to the university's mission. Uh, our mission is to aim at what we call scientific literacy, the ability to ask questions based on curiosity about the world around us, search for answers, and know how to appreciate them. A definition coined by the Dutch Association of Science Museums. We think teaching the public about uh, the scientific method is crucially important, especially in this day and age of alternative facts. The museum is convinced that the current fact-free discourse will not be countered by providing even more facts, but by conveying insight into the methods of scientific research. So our ambition is to become the first research museum of the Netherlands. Not a science museum like we are now, until now, uh, and that presents the, res the results of scientific research. A research museum that involves the visitor in the scientific process. The whole museum will transform into a laboratory where historical objects, contemporary research, and inquiry-based learning are interconnected. And citizen science, citizen science labs will be part of this approach. In these labs, uh, visitors participate hands-on in real scientific research. We experimented with citizen science in different pilot programs over the last few years, as you can see in this picture. And uh, one of them was uh, a cooperation uh, with the Westerdijk Institute for Fungal Research, called the Fungi Lab. The Institute has the largest collection of fungi in the world and is constantly looking for new species. The museum visitors could participate in fungal research by sending in a soil sample from their own garden using a special kit that had been designed for this purpose and that they could collect at the museum. These samples were analyzed by the Westerdijk Institute uh, and uh, you could follow it on, uh, on a website. And if a new species of fungus was found, it was named after the person that sent it in. And on this picture, you can see Anne-Sophie uh, pointing out the spot where she sampled the fungus named after her, the Talaromyces Anna-Sophie. Now the citizen science labs will be part of our programming of our new museum, 
but we also want to familiarize the visitor with research in the permanent galleries. So we are now developing new interactive exhibits that will take the visitor uh, through three levels of interaction. ACT, which is a simple introductory activity that will activate the visitor. Discover, a more complex activity that digs deeper. And learn to ask questions, a program in which visitors make their own choices and which will be supported by our museum guides. We found out that exhibition designers find it very hard to develop such exhibits because they're much more used when they think of interaction of games with a standardized answer and a reward. And we want a much more open process where the question is more important than the answer. So we do a lot of the development ourselves at the moment. To conclude, I would like to give you a preview of one of the holes that we are developing right now, uh, which will make this approach more clear. Uh, this is the draft design phase, so it's very simple um, drawings. Um, this whole this is part of the whole of geology uh, and the scientific method that we try to convey here is finding connections. We introduce Peter Harting, a geology professor at Utrecht University in the 19th century, and Lucas Laurens, a current professor of geology. They both use drill cores from the subsoil to reconstruct the past. Our visitors will work with drill cores themselves. In the first stage, we we'll look for patterns in the drill core, dark spots, for instance, that reflect wet periods of the past, but periods in which a lot of rain uh, has, has fallen. The next stage, discover stage, is to discover what guide fossils mean and can do. So the visitor will look for foraminifera. These are skeletons of unicellular organisms that are very often used uh, as guide fossils. And the last stage is a guided program where the visitor learns to ask questions by finding out which fossil is real and which is fake. Using this kind of interaction, we introduce the visitor to the process of scientific research um, because the museum will not just explain what the uh, scientific method is, but allow the public to perform the scientific method and in so doing understand more about the nature of science. The goal is not to make them more trusting of science institutions, but better citizens of a democracy who, who can engage in informed debate about scientific issues going beyond the sound bites that we currently hear so, so much. The new museum will be a platform for public engagement for Utrecht University. It supports the university's policies, and at the same time, it could not be developed without the university's institutional support. The university embarks on a strategy of open science, and the museum will be its most visible stage for the general public. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, I find it uh, wonderful that, uh, you know, as a child, you can go to a museum and not just about learning things, but then you, 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 you leave the museum with a fungus named after you. I think it's a, it's a, it's a really uh, interesting experience that uh, Anne-Sophie must have had, uh, had there. Uh, it's, uh, um, I think we see already some, uh, uh, some uh, parallels in between these two quite different uh, uh, approaches from within a university or from a big uh, uh, ind independent museum uh, that uh, uh, the um, central role of uh, the uh, methods of science uh, uh, is uh, really present in both of you. Uh, I see, uh, thank you uh, to the audience for uh, already very interesting questions. Uh, uh, I propose that uh, we uh, listen to a, a, a first reaction from Catherine uh, uh, that has uh, also some points uh, uh, from the point of view of, uh, uh, of somebody who does not work in a specific museum, but that has uh, the, probably the best observatory on tendency on European uh, uh, museums. So uh, I think Catherine can uh, uh, prepare her, um, her uh, presentation. Uh, please keep going in uh, asking questions. Uh, they are already very stimulating, uh, so uh, our speakers could already start thinking on how to uh, react uh, to this uh, uh, right after uh, Catherine's speech. So now I leave the floor to Catherine Franch uh, from uh, Excite uh, Network.
Hello. Um, as um, Matteo said, I won't be speaking from the same perspective. And I invite you first to think of that question, what we've seen so far uh, involving citizens in research process, is that useful? And so I want to read you two sentences. One is um, the following. Scientists as a group are among the most trusted in society. However, the authority of science evidence to help resolve political debates is being challenged. And the next one, to evaluate the concept of trust in science accurately, it is necessary to consider not only scientists, but also the scientific method, scientific organizations, <clears throat> and more widely science as a social system. This comes from a very interesting report from um, the European Commission, the GRC, uh, that is part of the European Commission, and I think it shows clearly that we are all part of a system. Why is this useful? We, uh, Antonio or, or Paul, and, and you will hear it later on, we are worried or, or concerned about mistrust of science authority, and this has a strong impact on political and societal decisions. They are crucial today, you know that. What's the answer to that? Is it more communication of facts and results? Actually, no. Facts don't necessarily change minds. And that's demonstrated by research. So as scientists, I'm asking you to trust research and to forget about the idea that giving more facts, more information, and more results will actually increase trust or change people's mind. What we need is more and better or different engagement, notably on the science process. Actually, most citizens don't understand how science works. And this is why we brought this session here at ESOF. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 um, brought us uh, a very sad demonstration of what has been said and will be said. It showed that there is a profound misunderstanding of how science works. We've seen a strong polarization of trust and mistrust. Many people trust more science, but also mistrust and disinformation has been much more uh, prominent and sometimes in, um, I would say, very difficult situations. I know people who, who've had um, death threats from bringing science, uh, decoding science. And this also um, shows, the pandemic also shows, the difficulty that we have in changing our behaviors either citizens' behaviors or politicians' behaviors, behaviors based on science recommendations. From this, we can conclude that long-term investment in sciences in society is needed, much more than short-term interests and in thinking, which is, of course, our natural way of doing things. But if we are responsible, we cannot think this way. Now, um, Matteo has asked me to present twice. So normally I should be back after, uh, in a few moments, after the, the, the two other speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Yes, yeah, it's very interesting uh, uh, to have uh, this uh, larger view from uh, two uh, uh, specific examples. What I propose now, if it is possible, is to uh, be in mosaic view. So we can uh, have a, a first moment uh, around of uh, uh, questions because there are some from the audience uh, and maybe you can take uh, some time, uh, you the speakers, to uh, uh, go deeper in some of the, uh, of the issue. And then uh, as uh, anticipated, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have two more speakers. We will provide two more examples. We will ask again Catherine to uh, give us a, a, a wider view uh, based on these examples and have a, a second session and a global session of question and answer, which will lead us to 11.30 when we have to, uh, uh, to stop, 11.45, sorry, when we have to uh, stop our, uh, our talk. So um, uh, if we are now in mosaic view, I don't have full control uh, on the system. Uh, there is a, a, a very uh, specific and, uh, and uh, punctual uh, question uh, to uh, Antonio Gomez da Costa. Uh, uh, the question, uh, I, I may read it uh, as it is, uh, most scientists are worried, actually, about the renovation of the Palais. 
there is indeed a movement in France, uh, this is me speaking, uh, that uh, uh, question the, uh, the, this uh, renovation uh, um, plan that you have, uh, uh, that you have presented. Uh, the, 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 the question of the, uh, of the person in the audience says, uh, the, the, the Palais de la Découverte will have less space than before and more space given to commercial activities. So uh, I'd like to ask this question to Antonio, uh, maybe quickly, because it's a very specific one, but uh, it's important to, uh, to answer to this, uh, to this. Well, yeah, I, I'll answer very quickly. And it's kind of a curious question because it, uh, it, it goes along the same process that sometimes we see now about misinformations and things being said in one place and in another. I mean, this is a very legitimate and we are very uh, obviously happy uh, about this involvement and engagement of all the society uh, about the Palais de la Couverte shows the, 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 how, how dear it is to the scientific community and to the public in general, actually. Um, to, to answer very specific, very quickly, no, there will not be less space. Um, there are two things that circulate frequently, which is uh, human uh, explainers and, and interaction with the public will disappear in favor of screens. Uh, and there will be less space. No, there will not be less space in the Palais de la Découverte. Uh, there is a proof foreseen a, a, a commercial space. It's not a commercial space. It's a, an area that is outside of the perimeter of the Palais de la Découverte, which will be mutualized between the Palais and the other uh, institutions um, in the same overall buildings um, for restaurant restoration and for uh, museum shops and all these kind of things. So it's not necessarily commercial space, and it's outside the perimeter of the Palais. And um, so the, 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 the surface foreseen in the project for public offer is the same that we have now. And uh, I would add just this human interaction, as I explained, is at the core of uh, the, what we want to put at the Palais, continue this, obviously with the uh, interaction with explainers and with scientists and with researchers. And this is basically the fundamental of the project. <laughs> Thank you, Antonio. It would be interesting to engage in a sort of a, a contradictory uh, debate. Uh, this is going to be impossible. In any case, if you want to uh, comment on, also on Antonio's answer, do not hesitate to use the chat. I will uh, uh, try to summarize uh, what's happening there. So the, the answer is that there is an engagement of not reducing space. And, uh, uh, but uh, of course, the issue is not only about the number of square meters, but what it is done in, this, uh, in these square meters. And this, I think it's uh, very healthy, uh, living myself in France, uh, 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 that uh, there is um, protest, contradictions, uh, movement uh, that will only can enrich the, the, the final results uh, and uh, uh, one of the principle is uh, to be able to listen to all voices in order to make uh, uh, advance together and this is something also which can apply to uh, um, uh, scientific controversies uh, or the one uh, what we call socio-technical controversies. Um, uh, thanks Antonio. There is another very interesting question and I'm happy that I think while it was posed uh, Paul Vogt uh, was mentioning uh, in his uh, description of what is open science, which is a uh, uh, recognition uh, uh, to scientists for public engagement. I read the question. A general question is how to incentivize and reward researchers to engage with the public. Current assessment practices focus on research outcomes, so journal publication, so it's not aligned with the broader value, uh, values of research. So it was very interesting that, uh, Paul, you introduced the full concept of open science, which we unfortunately quite often reduce to the issue of open access. Uh, the way it was also framed at European level, it was not just open access. It was the four dimension that you quoted, where there is a, a public engagement and recognition for scientists. Is there some way in which uh, uh, our work uh, as public engagement institutions, museums, uh, associations, and etc., can help uh, drive uh, this change uh, where scientists are uh, rewarded, uh, of course, uh, through publication, but also in a more general sense on the way they help research to advance, which is not just uh, publication, is also the way it, they become relevant for society. Is there something is going to be uh, visible in, uh, in the renovation? Uh, I ask first Paul Vogt but maybe, then maybe also the others have some, uh, uh, some, some insight. 
Well, the, um, uh, the idea to, to do something about rewards and incentives is, is something that, that is uh, a broad movement now in the Netherlands. It's supported by the, the Association of Dutch Universities, so uh, of all the Dutch universities. And uh, they engage on, on the, uh, to this uh, uh, new policy. Uh, one of the things is that, that it, it will not be just uh, a quantity anymore, which is very often the case uh, uh, still, but quality what, what counts in, in, uh, in what you produce. So not the, not the number of, of, of articles or the number of citations, etc. Uh, and also that there is a balance between the individual and the collective, uh, which is also, also often uh, in, in this balance. Um, so that's, that's a, a, a nationwide policy that is now um, starting and which will be very important to, to, to give um, researchers the uh, room to, to do something on public engagement. We can do not much more than for um, the, um, uh, the stage uh, and, and, and help them and uh, um, assist them as, as good as, as we can, but it, it does take uh, a lot of effort from scientists themselves. So we see that it's often quite a struggle because sometimes, like I showed some of the citizen science examples, uh, some of them uh, lasted a few weekends and others uh, were there for, for six months. So, uh, but as long as, as the results are, are uh, uh, useful to the scientists, it's, it's of course uh, something that helps both ways. In your uh, presentation, you mentioned uh, the fact that most of the guides of the explainers of the people that are on the floor to meet publics are students from uh, Utrecht University. Which values you give to that not, uh, for the students? Uh, is, is, do you think is something that uh, belongs uh, is sort of an external things that they will do uh, like if they were uh, doing their extra for extra money little job or is something that has a, a specific value in their development as students uh, in, in science? Until now, it's it's just a job uh, for which they get paid. Uh, but what we are uh, discussing with um, uh, science communication. Um, uh, department to see whether we can be part of their curriculum so that they can also get points for that. So uh, as we, when we reopen in two years time, we, we hope to be in a new system where it's also part of their uh, curriculum, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, if the other speakers uh, want to react to this point, also Leonardo and Dacia, even if you didn't speak yet, if you have comments, uh, please uh, feel free and, uh, uh, and Catherine. Uh, um, I would like to, to, to link this uh, question uh, uh, by asking a question uh, maybe uh, also to, uh, to Catherine. Uh, this problem of recognition, I think also the public engagement uh, community have a bit of the same, uh, the same issue. You mentioned clearly that uh, uh, the main uh, uh, challenge that we face is a long-term one. It's not just providing reaction to one single news and provide a, a counter information, let's say a contrainformazione for the Italians, uh, uh, is building a long term uh, uh, understanding of the scientific process. Uh, however, uh, when we are uh, try to support the public engagement activity, we are asked to prove uh, uh, of short term uh, results. Uh, do you see this uh, as a problem for our community? Yes, that, that's a very good question. And this notion of, of measuring impact with indicators that are not from our field or, or that are very short term and very often quantitative. Uh, Leonardo might be talking about that, but we often hear that the Researchers' Night is, is a very good event because it attracts one million um, visitors. And what I think we we strive for is something that is much more profound in terms of uh, engagement because this is where we make the difference. Uh, the numbers might be useful reaching many people but to what extent do they, they engage in science and if we talk about and I really like Antonio's uh, expression a scientific attitude it's not by coming just for a short Term. So that's one one thing, but uh, I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later. We, of course, as from at the European level, we we look and we work with the 
uh, European Commission, and I, when I say we, I'm not talking about Excite, but all the science engagement organizations that are around this table. And it's rather disturbing to see um, some, to, to, to see the science and society program that has been there since the fifth um, framework program to, to see it disappear and so far not replaced by, by much or, or by something significant. So we, we have the feeling that this long-term um, perspective has been cut short for reasons that are um, not even demonstrated by what happened. Reports on the science and society program, reports from the commission, reports from the parliament were all extremely positive about that program and yet it disappeared. So it's a little bit difficult to um, um, give proofs, proofs that are not necessarily sometimes taken for, for other interests. Of course, this is a complex uh, situation, but um, it's becoming a complex frustration sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Kathleen. Maybe we, uh, by the end of the of the talk in the discussion, if the audience will uh, uh, agree by asking the question in that direction, we could uh, uh, go a bit further on uh, uh, what are the type of political support that uh, is needed in order to uh, build this uh, long term engagement, trust, alliance, uh, critical thinking that uh, we are talking about. Uh, uh, maybe we can uh, now go to the next uh, two speakers, two other examples. Uh, uh, this time we'll talk not uh, really about uh, uh, institutions uh, or museums uh, as transformation, but about uh, uh, specific, uh, specific action or events that can take place in museum or elsewhere. We will start from elsewhere. Uh, elsewhere means uh, the overall uh, European territory. And the example we will take is from Italy. Uh, European Researchers' Night is an event uh, that, uh, in principle, is quite traditional. Uh, researchers uh, talk about their science to the public. In recent years, uh, um, we have seen that uh, the way in which the, this encounter are, uh, are, um, are constructed, are built, are designed, is evolving very much in the directions that we have been uh, uh, sketching uh, uh, before. So Leonardo Alfonsi, also it's interesting because you don't come from a big uh, national institutions, but from uh, a relatively small uh, independent uh, uh, association. And uh, maybe you can tell us a bit how you see the evolution on uh, uh, European Researchers Night. Uh, So good morning, everyone, and thank you, Matteo, for introducing the topic. And in fact, my main, and I would say only point, would be to convince you or try to convince you that the Researchers' Night, the European Researchers' Night, is not, in fact, an event, but is a process. So I, I will try to uh, share, and I'm glad I can share with you this morning, uh, some example of what we did over the last uh, six years or mainly seven years, develop, trying to develop a, a different model of European Researchers Night. As Matteo mentioned, uh, I'm the director of a, a small social enterprise that is uh, Siquadro. We are based in the center of Italy, but we've been working on science engagement uh, over the last 20 years with many institutions all around Italy, many cultural partners. And this is one of the key of also my presentation today this collaboration with different cultural partners all over Italy and, uh, and Europe, trying to develop contents, formats, uh, and new ideas for public engagement uh, with science. What we did uh, in terms of the European Researchers Night is trying to uh, develop this as a process, as I said, from three different uh, perspectives, as a political process, as a cultural process, and as a global process. So I'm going now through uh, some examples of what I mean by political process. When we started the European Resources Night, the main idea that I also consider uh, a key idea in Europe uh, is the value of uh, the city. So we wanted to have the city at the center of this process uh, as a cultural motor 
to engage not only with citizens, but also with many stakeholders. So when we started, uh, we started in the center of Italy with the first project involving two cities in the region where we are based, that is Umbria, that is in fact here in the very middle of Italy with the two main cities in Umbria. Then we developed the process with other regions and other partners. And this is now the pictures of uh, uh, the picture of the project uh, that is called Sharper, meaning sharing researchers' passion for evolving responsibilities. And the point is on evolving responsibility with 12 cities around Italy. Uh, you can see the map, but not only cities, uh, but also the cultural institutions uh, in the city. So this is the list of the main consortium in Italy, uh, stressing the fact that we are working with uh, universities, research institutions, uh, with associations working on the relation between science and society, with museums like uh, Laboratorio Immaginario Scientifico, based actually in Trieste, and, uh, and us uh, working as a, as a coordinator. So uh, cities, institutions, uh, trying to uh, create a context for synergies. So what we've been doing over the last, uh, last six years was working with these cities, trying to uh, create bilateral or multi-actors working groups in each city. So together with the consortium that I've just presented, we developed the networks in each city of different actors, developing content, but also develop, developing long-term actions. So not only the idea of having the event on a specific night or on a specific week, but also trying to invite this city network to develop annual programs or, or, uh, or, or biannual programs uh, to work on contents and on public engagement. And also triggering institutional changes. I'm glad that one of the questions was about recognition, because in fact, one of the main points that we had achieved during this period was to start processes within universities, research institutions, but also within other cultural institutions to recognize the work of researchers and to recognize and to award the work of researchers. I am, I'd like to ask uh, to, to the question that was posed. I, I think that the trend and the approach should be on two levels. One is a national level trying to develop uh, a national award system for public engagement and a local level that means that each university, each research institution, but also cultural institutions should develop an individual and a local program to recognize the work of the actors involved in the process. From a, uh, the, another perspective, uh, we try to develop cultural processes. So all these actors uh, are, are working together are uh, uh, mixing their expertise and uh, are doing this uh, on a progressive uh, trend. So when we started uh, with these city networks, uh, we can start in small groups, but then uh, one of the goal is to develop the group all along the process, not only before the night, but also after the night, uh, looking for other actions. This is actually, uh, the spectrum of uh, uh, the kind of institutions involved. You can see that there are uh, some institutions from private sectors, other public institutions, the ma majority are research institutions, but the point is that some of them have never been worked together before. And some of them, this is one of the failures sometimes, will never work again <laughs> together. <laughs> but, uh, but this is part of the process and this is actually one of the more interesting uh, bit of the process. Um, another point uh, from a cultural uh, perspective is trying to develop training opportunities for all the actors involved in the process, not only for researchers, uh, trying to train them in public engagement actions, but also try, trying to train institutions to dialogue with, together with other institutions. This is a key point. Uh, as Catherine stressed, uh, we are working to increase the trust towards science. But I think personally that the trust towards science and scientists, uh, it's a matter of trust among different actors. Uh, so the, the key step would be to try and reinforce this recipro reciprocal trust. Obviously developing contents, developing format that uh, help 
uh, the actors to try and learn to listen to citizens. This is a, a, a very simple one, the researchers on top, but in fact, the key point of the researchers on top in, is not only to do public engagement activities in the pub, but to learn how to listen to the people asking questions and looking for dialogue in a specific, a very different context. It must be a global process. Uh, so not only a cultural, a political process, but also a global dimension. So although we started with the relevance of the city, we wanted the city to start a process also with other cities uh, around Europe. And, and this is the picture of, uh, of this year effort uh, with other European Researchers Night project around Europe, with whom we started to develop a new idea that is the mobility of researchers. So we wanted to use the Researchers Night as an opportunity and also all the uh, follow up of the night as an opportunity to start the mobility of researchers within the context of public engagement in a way is uh, similar to what uh, Antonio stressed in his presentation. So public engagement institutions and research institutions all around Europe working together uh, for a mutual exchange of experience and also develop together joint actions. As Catherine stressed, we are too much, too much concerned about figures. We have to be concerned about figures and attendees, but we want to develop together a quality system to assess what we are doing. And this is one of the main joint actions that we want to develop together with all the other projects. And so this is not an event, this is a process. And the main goal of the process uh, is to build trust among the actors involved to jointly tackle societal challenges. And in fact, the topic that we choose with our Sharper project this year is to try and involve citizens in discovering how researchers are tackling the uh, goals of the Agenda 2030. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Leonardo uh, Alfonsi. Um, uh, we will uh, develop this. Uh, there are questions that are already uh, helping uh, going further on, on the direction you, you, you started to put on the floor. Uh, but I think it, it, it's really natural now to go uh, and listen to the, uh, to the example that Dacia Atienza uh, will, uh, will uh, present, which is BioBlitz. I think uh, the idea of citizen science, of citizen participation, uh, uh, is, uh, um, uh, has been evoked in almost all the other talk. So I think it's good that we have uh, one example uh, of a museum that engage in something called the BioBlitz. It will tell us uh, what it is. Maybe you can just start uh, sharing your screen and prepare your presentation in which uh, uh, citizen science uh, and the participation of science of citizens in the scientific uh, uh, research uh, is core. I can anticipate maybe a question that we will ask later, I will let you present, but one of the uh, people ask if uh, uh, the citizen participation is just uh, reduced to uh, participating in collecting data or, or if there are ways in which citizens can also participate in asking the questions. So if the uh, original research question comes uh, bottom up from uh, uh, a societal demand uh, rather than uh, a research demand. And the equilibrium between the two is a very interesting topic in, uh, in citizen science processes. But we, we can keep this for later now. Let's listen to the example from, uh, from Barcelona. Good morning again, and yeah, I, I'm happy because I, I think I can summary some of the questions that had been rise up uh, during the, the last minutes. I'm going to show you or present our citizen science project that it's called BioBlitz Barcelona, as just as an example of how collaborations between different actors or stakeholders 
and how participation could help a research project, a real research project, and also uh, to policymakers. I'm not sure that all our audience is familiarized with the term BioBlitz, but it's a common name used since 1996 for a project that means that people from different um, sectors, like citizens, uh, uh, scientists, NGOs, natural organizations come together to a specific place and during a certain time of period that it's all more, most of the time 24 hours, they start to try to know everything that is there in terms of how many animals and planet, uh, pl plants are there. So it's a race uh, against uh, time and it's this is how it looks like. In our case, we run our BioBlitz once a year and during a whole weekend. And you can see for the pictures, we have uh, schools with children, we have families, we have adults, we have uh, students from university, we have labs, we have a base camp, and we are all together there trying to make an inventory of the biodiversity of a specific or certain place in the city. Our BioBlitz have four values that we want to address or stress. The first one is discover the urban nature. This is something very important for us. The other one is to improve the biodiversity of the city the knowledge that we know about the biodiversity of the city. The third one is to put in contact in the same place and in the same moment, citizens, scientists, NGOs, government, policymakers. So in the same place, they, all the, the system is in, in, in the same way, trying to, to address a common objective. And the fourth objective that the project has is to ra raise awareness about uh, biodiversity and especially about urban biodiversity in Barcelona. So as you can see, it's a lot of activity during the whole weekend. And these are some of the results. The upper part of the slide, you can see these uh, numbers that sometimes are relevant and Leonardo mentioned them before. It's not only about participation. We start the, uh, from a very small pilot project on 2010 with no more than 90 participants. And we almost reached 1,000 1, participants during 2016. And it's not a matter of numbers. In the other table, you can see the species that we are able to identify during the, our events. Uh, but it's not only a tr in terms of number, how we measure the, ex the, the relevance of the project. In the lower part, you can see other measures that we, we made every year. One of it is if the participants make some change on their behavior after the, participa the participation on the project. And we ask them if they are able or engaged to participate in another biodiversity projects, long-term uh, projects. And they say a very high per percentage of them say, yes, they seem to, to be engaged to do it. And one of the most uh, high rate things about our BioBlitz is that public and citizens said that it's a unique opportunity to work with scientists together. And this is something that we have to keep in mind because there are not mediators between them. They are citizens and scientists working together to build up this uh, biodiversity inventory. This is only to show you which is the organization of the project. The museum is the leader of it, but we have other co-organizers. We have the scientists and the volunteers that bring the knowledge to the project. We for sure have the public and we have also other the sponsors. But 
this is not really what I want to show you. I want to show you how this looks like in the terms of the quadruple Alex framework, which is, uh, I think, something that um, Catherine mentioned about that we are all part of the same system and we have to work all together. So the chart that I said I uh, showed you before, we can arrange in a different way. In the BioBlitz, we have with the museum and the research institutions, the universities that brings the knowledge. We have the government because the Barcelona Council is part of the project as a core organizer, but also sometimes as a scientist also participating on the project. We have the social organizations and the citizens as the NGOs, the natural institutions, and we also have uh, some kind of industry or private sector uh, through our sponsors. So we really have a real representation of the whole system on the, on the project. And how this translate to some of the questions that, that we mentioned before. How we decide where the bioblitz will be run. So, it's not that the museum just decide, okay, we are going to do the bioblitz in certain point of the, of the city. We make the government part of the decision. And how we do that? They just said us which part of the cities are in, uh, they have a special interest because they want to protect them or they want to review their policies about the protection of the spaces. For instance, the last year is the red is the red uh, space we we work is the Tres Turons Park. Right now, there are three different parks. They are naturally connected, but in terms of policy and management, they are not connected at all. So last year we were working there, and the idea is to prove that it's a very high interest. Uh, area in terms of biodiversity. So they are going to make some kind of policy to integrate the three parks in just one. And this will, re um, this will really translate on a real policy to the, to the city. And there's another example that I want to highlight and it's in terms of how citizens can um, translate or uh, how projects can be done by the citizens. This is uh, another uh, small spin-off project from the BioBlitz Barcelona, which is called BioBlitz Barrios, which means neighborhood. And in 2017, uh, a small part of our participants came to the museum and said to us that they were part of our BioBlitz event during that year. And they live in another part of the city and they, have, uh, they were really concerned about some kind of policies that the Barcelona Council want to do in some of their parks and that part of the, of the city. And they, they asked us to use the BioBliss process to know the biodiversity on those parks and to present to their government uh, another way to, to think on their, on their spaces. So right now, for the last four years, it was a group of neighbors that they are running a small event of BioBlitz to, to make the, um, the biodiversity list of those parks. And right now, those parks are in a special uh, protect uh, system. So it's another example of how citizens can arrange their own projects to, to, to make real uh, policies or to approach to their real managers. And I don't want to, to forget about the science behind the project. And I just want to, to show the importance of the citizen science data on the relevant science. And it, this is something just to, to show you that during the last 20 years, the presence of BioBlist data sets on publications, on high impact publications, it's going uh, higher. 
and in in our in our case uh we find some new specimens for the for new species for the city new registers for the city so there's some very quality high quality uh data behind the citizen science project so sometimes uh for scientists is something that they really concern about the quality of the results but we we prove that they are really high quality results and uh, in summary, I just want to say that uh, it's everything a matter of trust because scientists trust in the government because the results of the project will be used for real policy manager and good practices. The citizens really trust in us that the results that they are collecting will be used in a real policy policymaker decisions and the government and the policymakers really trust in us to give real good quality data. So I think it's uh, a really good example of, uh, yeah, we are all part of the system and we really build some trust relationship between all of us. And that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Dacia, for this example. I thank you, Leonardo and Dacia, together, because I think you clearly set up uh, uh, um, uh, a landscape. You, you showed us uh, a system in which uh, the importance of partnership, of, of not seeing science and society relationship just as a communication between one group, which is scientists, and the other group, which is uh, uh, the public in general, but with a very complex multilateral uh, uh, system of interactions that uh, uh, needs to work uh, uh, well all together in order to uh, to have this uh, uh, yeah, this positive evolution uh, uh, of the place of research in society and vice versa, uh, as well as the importance of uh, of listening. I think we could uh, uh, um, debate a bit uh, uh, later. Uh, also, I think it was interesting to see how the 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 the, the, the the term that uh, Leonardo used, uh, which is uh, a science engagement activity like a researcher's night, is a process, is not just uh, just an event. And so a process needs a, a, a begin and an end. And the beginning is a bit uh, the origin of the question. And uh, uh, the, the, the question of the visitors is uh, uh, of the one of the um, questions that we uh, just had is how much can we uh, uptake the questions uh, 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 of the citizens? Uh, that in order to pose the relevant research questions. And on the other hand, Dacia, you very well uh, pointed out how the, the consequences of this process uh, are important. Uh, uh, that is, uh, have a real impact, uh, not only on more informed citizens, but also on decision making in a city and also on research publication for researchers. So I think it are wonderful cases in which this multilateral partnership is indeed taking place and it has an origin which is uh, uh, rich and a consequences which is not only on uh, uh, learning, but also on uh, uh, active political and scientific uh, um, uh, issues. Um, um, I, as promised, I would like to give the word again to, uh, to Catherine. Uh, from the uh, Excite point of view, uh, uh, which means also uh, a link in, uh, in uh, consulting, helping and seeing uh, uh, how all, all what we are saying relates to the way in which uh, uh, Horizon 2020 and the new uh, uh, science policies in Europe are structuring, including the, the mission-oriented uh, uh, approach. So maybe, Katrin, uh, uh, you can have uh, uh, the floor. Uh, um, to the people who are listening, don't hesitate to ask more questions. There are already three or four which are uh, uh, quite relevant that we will uh, uh, pose. So if you have urgent questions, do it now, uh, because it might be that then it would be too late. Uh, Catherine, so it's up to you now. Thank you, Matteo. So uh, again, I'll speak from a very different perspective and I'll try to be short so that we can have time to discuss. Um, so the EC, the European Commission, says very often that it wants to engage European citizens in science. We hear about co-creation, we hear about citizen engagement, citizen science. Um, but, but 
weirdly enough, um, hold on, my slide is not moving. Uh, weirdly enough, uh, I cannot move my slide, but uh, maybe I'll just say what I want to say. Um, so while, while the technician is, is trying to fix this, um, as we said before, the only program that was dedicated to science and society, and that was called SWAFs, but the only science and society program has been killed in the um, next Horizon Europe program. So what is um, the answer? Can I ask the technician to take away my slide if it's not working? Thank you. I, um, so I've asked to, to delete the slide, but I still only see the slide on my screen. Anyway, I'll try to <laughs> be as convincing as possible. So as I said, um, the only program uh, has been deleted. What is the answer from the European Commission so far? It's twofold. They say we will mainstream um, science and society in the research projects, and the missions will be also doing a lot of uh, citizen engagement. If we look at mainstreaming, what does that mean? Mainstreaming in the research projects? Well, if you believe this is important, I'm sure you probably would not do it without any incentives uh, and without um, any, any um, institutional support. Um, I think the only way is to ask for it. If we don't ask, the, only, the, the answer we get is a no. <laughs> so that's quite clear. And when I say we, I think it's all of us. We have seen a lot of good examples from that most of the examples that we've shown you are uh, developing strong partnerships. And as Leo said, it's a trust between actors. We need to break those silos and... Uh, I'm sorry to say this may be a bit bluntly, but I think researchers have to stop thinking they, they can do science communication alone or doing, doing it in a good way. All the examples we've, we've seen clearly demonstrate that there's a, a strong design that goes into them. And it's from the beginning to the end, it's the organization, but it's also the framing of these events that make them successful or not. And so I strongly encourage every one of you to work with the partners that uh, you've seen here around the table and that are around you. The other answer from the European Commission are uh, with the missions. There's a lot of money that is dedicated to these missions. The citizens are increasingly asking for an augmented democracy in which they have their say. So involving citizens in the mission doesn't look like an option, it looks like a must. But those missions, if you look at how they are, um, how they will develop, there's an issue of time. Time is long between the mission that is announced, uh, the cause, the projects and the results. There's an issue on the format. How will we deliver the, the results? through a deliverable, through a scientific jargon. This is very difficult for citizens to seem to grasp and to understand. There's an issue on the impact that the mission, a good mission for a scientist is probably one that brings good results. A good mission from the citizen's perspective is one that changes my life. So what is the impact of my life? Will those missions be able to answer that clearly? Not so sure. 
And then there's the notion of process. A failure in science is very often useful. A failure for the citizens might just be a failure. And again, we come back to this notion of do the citizens understand the scientific process? So what's the answer or what could we do about that? We, we believe that um, around we should develop engagement opportunities around the mission topics and not necessarily the mission themselves. If there's a mission on oceans, it would make sense to use the um, instruments that the European Commission has already to develop calls on the topic, but not necessarily on the mission, to increase science engagement awareness, to increase critical thinking, to increase knowledge on, on the, on the um, topic, but most of all, to engage people and to make um, them part of, of the process. We believe this should be done with science engagement professionals. Science communication is um, a field by itself. It has researchers, it has professionals who have worked in it for a long time. It would be a shame not to increase the uh, synergy between policymakers, NGOs, publics, science communication professionals, researchers, of course. We also believe this should be done with appropriate funding. That's quite clear. And incentives also for the researchers, as Paul was mentioning. Um, and maybe most of all, science communication and science engagement should be done seriously. By seriously, I mean with the evidence that we have of what works and what doesn't. Seriously meaning good science means good science communication done with professionals on both sides. Seriously means that the words that policymakers use, such as co-creation or co-design, are real words and not simply communicative work. So um, this being said, I um, thank you for um, for your attention, and I thank you for maybe fighting for what we believe in and asking for what we need. Once again, thank you. Thank you, Katrin. Uh, so speaking up as the only way to make uh, to make change. Uh, we have only seven minutes left, uh, so uh, there are quite interesting uh, um, questions that are uh, that are being uh, asked. Uh, and uh, I'd like to pick uh, uh, be before, sorry, before picking up the question, just the issue of citizen science and of uh, all the, 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 the questions that are around it. For example, the one asked about who's asking the question, which is a, 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 a crucial one. Uh, I'd just like to, uh, uh, to, uh, to make a, a, an information piece. Uh, there is a, a European uh, Association of Citizen Science, the ex European Citizen Science Association, and their conference is in Trieste, right? Uh, uh, start on the sixth, so it's next week, and uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a conference entirely devoted to this uh, to this specific topic. So it's uh, um, it's a uh, uh, it's a good occasion if you're curious about how uh, the, the the debate and the discussion and this role of citizen participation in science in, in public engagement, uh, um, how how it is uh, discussed and structured in the community. So this is an important aspect. Uh, one of the questions says, uh, uh, when uh, I interpret it a bit, when we uh, develop something which is quite sophisticated, new, uh, in, uh, like uh, trying to embed in the scientific methods, uh, uh, so a long process, a process that requires a cultural attitude which is favorable to this, we might preach to the converted. We might touch only a few uh, a, a, a few people. Uh, so I'd like to ask uh, quickly if you can uh, uh, some of the speakers, uh, uh, whoever wants to intervene, uh, are these uh, um, interesting approaches that we have we have heard uh, risking to lose the majority of the public and just concentrate on the one that are already convinced of the value of the scientific methods? So who wants to answer to this? And I don't Antonio Gomez da Costa from University. Just, just, just two observations that actually pertain to a lot of the, the questions in that, of that one. Well, as I usually say, 
uh, if you preach, you normally get only the converted. So you have to stop preaching. That's the kind of tricky thing to do. Um, the, 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 for me, and this relates also with other things about trust and everything, is that in all we do in, in this engagement, engagement means in many directions and in many actors, as Dutch and many other people have been saying, and Leonardo. And, and it means also that we consider the public or the publics as entities by themselves. What I mean is the following. We have a, there is a tendency sometimes to think about public engagement activities as activities where we will consider the public as would-be scientists. That is to say, people that would become to understand the science, and practice science, everything like in, in this direction. Now, there is a lot to be said about asking questions to the public, not to be answered by science, but asking questions to the public that can be answered by the public and of interest to scientists. And this is a kind of a, an engagement that sometimes is difficult to do, but really it's something that we should, in all the, the, the citizen science and other projects, is actually having scientists asking questions to the, to the people in front of them, not for the sake of people understanding the science, but actually asking questions where they are interested in knowing the answer, that the citizen in front is able to give the answer and that the answer is relevant for their research or for their perspective of the question they are trying to analyze. Thank you very much for this answer. Actually, I had uh, a comment on the fact that I did not present myself. I'm sorry about that. Matteo Merzagora, I work in France for an association called TRAS, and I've been teaching science communication since a long time, including uh, uh, next door to the ESOF conference in Trieste at CISA, where a master in science communication exists for more than 20 years, and together with Paola Rodari, we were doing uh, a course. Uh, just to uh, um, answer another question and uh, re react on Antonio's, uh, recently, uh, my personal experience I decided that in my course in science communication, I stop to teach scientists how to talk to the public. I start teaching them how to listen to the public. The, the type of course we do now uh, at RAS here in Paris is completely reversed. We uh, ask scientists to uh, train themselves to uh, look at society and to extract relevant information that can be meaningful for their research. And I think it's something that uh, uh, combines with some of the uh, issues that were treated here. Uh, in concerning the uh, importance of these uh, complex and uh, uh, and uh, juicy partnerships that needs to be uh, to be to be built, um, uh, we have some uh, uh, thank you, bravo for an excellent session, which is uh, also a nice uh, comment. Thank you for those uh, who asked. Uh, uh, I don't think we have time to answer a complex question, but I like to relate it because it's a, it's a really relevant one. Uh, in formal education, where we do not have the problem of uh, small groups, it's more than 90% of the population, uh, the scientific approach, I'm reading the questions, uh, uh, the scientific approach and methods are more and more developed. Uh, did you see a difference in the trust in science outputs in different ages classes? So starting from the moment in which we started at school, at, so reaching 90% of the population to treat the scientific method, do we see uh, a difference in the way uh, the, the people relate with, the scienti with, the, with scientific information uh, or uh, um, scientific presence in decision making and et cetera? Uh, I think this is an extremely uh, uh, complex question that I will um, safely protect uh, uh, the speakers around the table from trying to answer in 57 seconds, uh, but uh, that I think shows that these type of questions are really relevant. Data exists, uh, but they are really, really hard to read because uh, 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 of uh, two factors. One is time, the consequence we see it in a long time, and the other is multifactorial uh, events. Uh, is not just uh, the fact of including the scientific method that can make change, is a mixture of many, uh, of many factors that in all evaluation, in all impact, there was another question about impact, uh, is always complicated because it's multifactorial. And uh, um, this 20 last second are just going to be dedicated to thanking all our speakers uh, from being here, for thanking ASOF to uh, uh, invite uh, a session uh, of this type uh, within the conference. And uh, good conference, uh, good rest of the conference to all. And thank you for, uh, to all the speakers. And thank you to the participants. <laughs>